Hello again to uh, the Week in Blog. Uh, Con Carroll, this is his week off. He's had a uh, uh, hard duty the last few weeks uh, going up against uh, Matt Stoller and John Amato. <laughs> so he deserves a respite. Um, uh, another Bill is joining me. Why don't you introduce yourself again to the Blogging Heads uh, fan base out there? Sure. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm William Butler on First Reference and then also Bill thereafter. Uh, I work at New Media Strategies, is an online PR, marketing, and all kinds of things firm in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I, uh, I write a blog at blogpi.net, and you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash William Butler. That's my, that's, that's my best intro so far, I think. The smoothest. Excellent. So and just in case people have forgotten, because I've been away for a few weeks, uh, Bill Share, Campaign for America's Future, and liberaloasis.com. I also Twitter, but I don't really know why anyone would, would follow what it's Bill I have Schur. to say there. Twitter.com slash Bill Sure. You can read about what I eat for lunch. That's, 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 my, that's my Twitter niche. <laughs> so um, the biggest thing I would say in the blogosphere this week uh, was in the conservative blogosphere. For uh, once, in, actually. What's that? I say for once. Usually it's a little quieter. <laughs> uh, in, in conjunction with what was going on on the House floor with some of the conservative House members, and this is the, the don't go movement. Do right. I say number sign don't go movement? Is there some pr- proper way to describe this? Yes. The, 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 the term you're looking for is a hashtag. It's, it's a pound sign or a hash mark. I think the, t- the actual, you know, here I'm, I'm, do, I'm making the, approximately making the shape with my fingers in front of the uh, camera. You know, it's the pound sign from the phone, basically. Um, so when I say hash don't go, when I say pound don't go? I, it's, it's, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, I think people call it the don't go hashtag. That's what they would call it. Gotcha. Um, so what, but, was the, what was the basis of this? How did this come about? What was the objective of it? And how, how effective has it been? Okay, that's a, that's a tall, tall order. Let's see what I can do here. Let me first back up and explain for readers who are maybe not quite as Twitter savvy. I, 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 you know, I meet people that don't know what Twitter is, and for a moment I'm a little surprised just because of the world that I travel in. Everybody I know is either a blogger or has something to do with the Internet. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, it's still used by a very small, select group of people, tend to be young, tend to be tech savvy. Uh, so Twitter.com, you know, the, is a, it's a microblogging service. You can use it to message people. People follow you. It's kind of like advanced, uh, advanced IM, advanced text messages. And uh, the, the hashtags specifically, if you are talking about a particular subject that other people you think are talking about as well, uh, then you can create a little, little symbol, a little code that, well, you drop that into your, into your tweet. That's what you call a little Twitter message. Um, and and that, that will basically, you can search again, you can search that. So if you go to search.twitter.com and you type in uh, pound sign don't go, you will find all of the, uh, all the bloggers who are using that particular phrase. And, and so that, if you want to find all those tweets, all those messages, do you have right. to go to, so there was a website created, don't go.us. Do I have to go there to read all those messages? You don't. Um, they're not there, as far as I'm aware. Um, there's actually more than one uh, Don't Go website, which I want to get to uh, a little bit later. But it, the best thing to do, if you do want to read what people are saying about it, is go to search.twitter.com and type in pound sign Don't Go, and you'll come up with. Uh, actually, I, I did. A, I ran a. I ran a. Uh, I ran a search using a. Um, uh, a, a graphing tool for, for Twitter, uh, at, for tweets, I suppose, earlier today. And uh, over the past few days, there have been uh, definitely more than 500, and I didn't get an exact number off it, but more than 500 tweets uh, in the past, say, since Friday, basically, about Don't Go. And, it, and Friday wasn't even the biggest day. It picked up more steam over the weekend. So, and and where, did, where did the name Don't Go come from? What was it meant to convey? What Don't Go means to convey is, well, uh, this is where we should explain what happened uh, on the House floor last Friday. Uh, it was about to be recess. The Democrats were ready to get out of town. Uh, the Republicans had badly wanted to uh, get a vote on energy legislation, uh, but Pelosi and the Democrats uh, were, were not as keen on the legislation as the Republicans were, as in they didn't want to pass it. And uh, so they left, and uh, the Republicans stayed on the floor 
even after the lights were turned out, albeit briefly, uh, the C-SPAN cameras uh, went off as well. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to see it on C-SPAN. Uh, that is uh, not Brian Lamb's fault, but that is because uh, C-SPAN does not control the cameras that are in at least the House chamber. That might be different from the Senate, but I'm not sure. And uh, the only way you could actually see it was, uh, was online, was uh, John Culberson is a representative from Texas who has uh, made a name for himself over the past few weeks, past maybe a few months by now, uh, as a big user of Twitter, as a big user of a service called Quick, that's Q-I-K dot com, uh, which lets you use a, like a flip camera and record yourself and stream that live over the Internet. That's what Quick dot com is. And, um, I mean, there's, there's even more backstory to this if we want to delve into the, the, the franking rules where Michael Capuano, who was a representative from Massachusetts, um, sought to – and I, I'm a little hazy in the details about whether he was setting up new rules or trying to enforce rules that had been ignored, but using the franking rules to try to uh, tell congressmen that they were uh, not exactly encouraged to be using things like Twitter – because they weren't, uh, they were not officially approved. Of course, the rules were written uh, long before uh, such a thing as Twitter came into existence, before blogs came into into existence. And I know people that have worked on the Hill and have had a heck of a time trying to get a blog set up. Uh, the the House leadership can do it, so the House leadership would also be able to use the Twitter. Uh, but they were trying to tell rank and file members they couldn't use it. Just as on, on the Senate side, it's even worse. Uh, John Henke. So, what, what on, were yeah. what were the House members trying to accomplish by using Twitter on the floor? Uh, the same thing that they've been trying to use blogs for over the past few years, and that is to get around the filter of the media. In this case, the the, the, the C-SPAN cameras were turned off entirely. So, if anybody was going to hear about what they were doing, it was all going to have to be done by themselves electronically, via Twitter, via Quick, and of course via email and blogs as well. Uh, but but Twitter and Quick have an immediacy that even blogs don't have. And uh, I, I've, I've seen people writing about how we're even entering uh, a post-blog world, which I'm not sure that I buy that. Um, that uh, the blogging era is so old. It's so, so outdated. It's so slow. <laughs> uh, you know, everything is, uh, hey, everything is speeding up. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what everybody's been saying since probably, a long, probably long before we were born. But, you know, obviously it, it is true that attention spans get shorter uh, because the, we are able to communicate faster. Uh, certainly, Mickey Kaus, one of the co-founders of the Blogging Heads, uh, has the great little theory, the filer faster thesis, uh, or maybe it's a theory still. I'm not sure if he's proved it exactly. But not only are things speeding up, is communication speeding up, but people's ability to process it as well is speeding up. And uh, that's how you can have a movement uh, like Don't Go launched basically over the weekend. So and even uh, though the, the conservative House members, they're not still Twittering inside the Capitol. Uh, but I, don't no, go I, was, I, I was out on Friday night. I, went, I, went, I finally went to go see uh, The Dark Knight Returns. And so I, I didn't find out about this until I, I got back later in the evening. So I assume they were tweeting, but I can't tell you for certain that they were. But, why but, but, they? but this week they haven't as much. I thought the actual House floor revolt thing had sort of petered out. Oh, oh well, okay. So, yeah, well, part of this now is the after Friday, the, uh, the members of the House, uh, the, the Republican caucus, uh, for the most part, also, you know, got out of town as well. So, don't go. It was trying to, okay, maybe this is a good point to mention the fact, as I did earlier, or go into the fact that there are four different websites right now that uh, have to do with don't go. There is don't go.us, and uh, that was the first one, and that's the one that is the most closely tied to the the hashtag. The hashtag. That's where you can see all the all the tweets in one place. Can you? I, I, when I was there earlier today, it was or at least the like top, the, the most recent twenty or something. Okay, that might be that. That for sure. There's also don't go movement.com, and then getting back to what you were saying about uh, you know the the uh, Republican revolt petering out. There's also a, uh, a website called callback, callbackcongress.com. And then as of last night, there is a fourth one that is go to workcongress.com. So, yes, they're trying to call back the Republicans to then also call back the Democrats who are, for the most part, not coming back. Some Republicans are. 
Um, I actually I wish I had remembered uh, which name I saw was was coming back to town, but probably more than one of them are. And um, this is you know it's maybe so. The first so time. am I mistaken? Are they still going to the house every day uh, and tweeting up a storm, even though there are no cameras oh. there? Is, is that still going on? I don't believe so. I don't believe they are on, in the house right now, but. So, I what's, so what's right. happening on with Don't Go and the, and the mm-hmm. actual Twittering if the Congress people themselves aren't still doing that? Oh, uh, well, the, and remember, this thing started on, uh, well, the, the Twitter that the Republicans revolt started Friday. Don't Go picked up over the weekend. And uh, so at this moment in time, uh, I believe you have a few members of the uh, Republican caucus who are coming back to D.C. to resume the fight. And uh, I don't know how many, and uh, we'll, uh, we won't probably when this thing is up by tomorrow, we'll have a better idea. But I, I, now that the Congress, now that, now that the Congress is closed for the, um, you know, for the recess, I don't really know that they can get it set up that way. I, I think they'll probably focus their efforts on, on on the media rather than necessarily going to the House floor. But I'm certainly no expert on uh, congressional um, procedures, so I reserve the right to be a little ignorant about that. So I guess I guess my the big question is is this the dawn of a new age of of Twitter politics, uh, a, a new mm-hmm. way to organize that's even better than than blog politics, and your next right colleague uh, Patrick Ruffini, mm-hmm. uh, he had a post up uh, saying elected officials cannot start movements on their own they need a willing audience to activate. The audience was primed by John Culberson leading the revolt against the ridiculous House franking rules. On the issue side, it was primed by Newt's Drill Now movement. That solidified Culberson and by extension minority Republicans as the troublemakers storming the gates with technology and Democrats as the lame defenders of an old order. That is the natural role of any political minority. But one House Republicans accustomed to the majority have been uncomfortable, uncomfortable embracing until now. I was around the blogosphere in 2002 and 2003. There were roughly equal numbers of conservative and liberal bloggers then, but liberals were using the blogosphere for the right things, changing the political system rather than commenting on it because their projects seemed more necessary and central to the Democratic coalition. They attracted most of the new growth up to 2006. He continues, uh, Don't Go is creating a perfect storm where the emergence of a new technology is married to a pressing need to do something. Republicans had the use of the tools down, but had no pressing to-dos in the early 2000s. As Matt Stiller reminded me in a joint radio appearance earlier, Democrats had impeachment, the recount in the Iraq war. We had to defend all these things. And online, it's a lot easier to be on offense than on defense. Uh, Jane Hampshire over at Fire Dog Lake um, challenged that post, and she said, uh, now the right roots folks are trying to play catch up with the don't go movement. And while I think Patrick is probably right, that's easier to play offense than defense. The idea that this was spawned as some sort of grassroots uprising is kind of a joke. The Republicans in the House are pulling a pretty thin stunt in demanding the Democrats not go on August recess until a solution is found to the energy crisis. And John McCain is applauding them. In theory, that's great. We have a huge energy problem in this country that definitely needs dealing with, have had for decades. But to pretend that their proffered solution, more drilling, is not one that was drafted by the oil companies, support with huge marketing budgets and enormous campaign donations, is pathetic. Newt Gingrich is leading the charge, for Christ's sakes. The whole thing is just more of the right roots acting as an echo chamber for their corp- party's corporate overlords, top-down messaging in extremists, no matter how many tweets you generate. Now, that kind of gets to the you know, <laughs> organicness of the don't go uh, movement, and perhaps that's a separate a, a separate question specific to don't go, as opposed to the question uh, is Twitter is Twitter politics a a new phase we're entering in? But uh, I'll I'll put the ball in your court. Which one of the two you want to address first? Whether Twitter politics is a, a new phase coming up, or what was the other one exactly? Is don't go nothing remotely, uh, not remotely anything grassroots oriented, but just an extension of a top-down corporate strategy for more drilling. Oh, okay. Well, I, I mean, I can take both. I think the first one quickly. Uh, I certainly have seen no evidence of there being any uh, any involvement by uh, what Exxon Mobil or, or Shell or BP. That's that 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 sounds like you know. Uh, lefty blogosphere paranoia about uh, who's really somebody must be pulling the strings of the Republican blogosphere. Otherwise, they wouldn't be saying these crazy things. 
So uh, I, I think Jane Hampshire is getting a little bit ahead, a little bit ahead of, ahead of herself on that. I, I, I'm mocking you visually, by the way. I don't mean it personally. Oh, oh, that's 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 what we're here for. I feel bad mocking when you can't see what I'm doing. Uh, I, I'm going to find out in about 48 hours, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually sitting in front of a couple of movie posters here. I have the Da Vinci Code behind me and National Treasure. So maybe uh, some conspiracy is going to envelop you <laughs> as soon as as soon as I find out exactly what's going on. I hope it doesn't reflect your actual movie tastes. No, no, it reflects my the company's actual movie clients. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, but the, so the, the future of politics on Twitter. You know, I think Twitter actually has – it's, it's very, very new, and uh, people are still figuring out just how to use it. I do think it's going – pardon me? I'm still here. Okay. Um, uh, I, think, I think that people are going to find more ways to use it over, you know, the coming years, and they, they already have. I think um, – I mean, has this worked? Has the, the drilling – uh, agenda been mm-hmm. significantly advanced by Twittering, or was it, or did the Newt Gingrich petition, which was very much an online activity, although greatly enhanced with a lot of conservative talk radio? Uh, well, didn't, didn't didn't Rafini call it a perfect storm? I think it, I think it very storm. much is. I guess, but can, can you actually single out the Twitter part of it? And said this really helped move the ball in some way that these other communication mechanisms didn't. Well, the one thing Twitter can do that a, a blog doesn't necessarily do is, uh, and uh, uh, we're assuming that the member of Congress is actually in charge of their own Twitter account, which seems to be the key thing here, that, that, that some of them are, and uh, that they can get messages directly from people who are following them on Twitter. Um, right now, Twitter is small enough that uh, it's, while you can't do one-to-one exactly, uh, you, can, you can kind of like, you, you can see, you, you can follow the messages more easily. And so somebody like Culberson or one of the many other uh, House Republicans who are using Twitter, um, they are getting messages from people on Twitter all the time, in this case, you know, saying, please don't go, or please come back, please call the Democrats back, and, um, you know, let's get moving on some, uh, some uh, energy legislation. So, okay, as, as far as Twitter goes, you know, I'm not sure this is a movement per se. I, I, I would dial it back a little bit from what Rafini is saying, uh, right now they have about 25,000 signatures, which is not too shabby. That's also a far cry from the, uh, was it 1.2, 1.4 million that Newt's Drill Here, Drill Now organization has. So it's, it is a start. It's certainly a positive sign for Republicans who have not who really had something to rally around for a little while. And, um, you know, I, I think the question about, you know, you were getting to this earlier or, or, or reading from what Rafini said about how, uh, Democrats have been playing offense for the past few years, and Republicans playing defense. Uh, that might be changing, and uh, obviously, if Obama becomes president, uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, what happens when Republicans start going on offense. Democrats have to play defense, and um, you know, I, I think I'm not sure if you read the line from Rafini's post there, where he says, "Should we actually see the blogosphere to the left?" I think that might be overstating things, but. To have a blogosphere that is then it also has a, a Twitterverse, I think is a term people sometimes use, that kind of like ties blog posts together, helps promote things faster. Uh, that allows critical mass to uh, be attained faster than in days of yore when people were just on these clunky old things called blogs. So it has certainly streamlined the communications process. And I think that's going to be one of its one of its key contributions to politics over the next few years, obviously putting, putting very interested constituents in closer contact with their members of Congress is another. Um, obviously, it depends on the member of Congress actually using it. So the fact that a number of mem- Republicans, obviously, as you know, have this feeling that they're behind online. Twitter felt like something I think that they could jump onto that the Democrats hadn't gotten out first on. And uh, so that, that probably explains partly why why Republicans have, at least at the moment, a, a short lead on Twitter. Culberson uh, is the member of Congress with the most tweets. And not, I'm sorry, not tweets, but probably that too. He's the member of Congress with the most followers at about 2,800, pushing 3,000. It's not huge. Is that a, it's not a movement like, uh, like Rush Limbaugh could corral. But all those people who are following are you know, members of the, the class of voters and activists who really care 
who you know follow politics and read blogs a lot. It's that is, influential um, is the term people like to use. Is the intention here to make don't go into something like a move on? It, it was the was the phrase even concocted as a as a flip side to move on the way move on started as an anti impeachment right. thing for Clinton that grew so. into something else. I don't think so. Um, I think the uh, – just guessing here, I believe that the intention would be to flip that back to something like, uh, like, like drill here, where drill here is already actually about the issue and don't go as trying to be a catalyst to fo- focus uh, members of Congress back on the issue. Um, although, as I mentioned, there being four websites, we clearly have four websites that promote don't go.us. Uh, they, I believe they, at least a couple of them are collecting different signature petitions. We have a case here of, I believe, a lack of discipline from uh, Republican Party activists, uh, at least the online conservative activists, who, you know, you have uh, the, the too many cooks. Everybody thinks it's a great idea, so everybody launches their own site. And um, that probably has an effect of diluting the message in the short term. Um, That's always the difficulty of uh, online organizing, um, the the. The hurting cats. The great, the, well, the, the upside of it is anybody can do it, so it brings more people into the process. Uh, the flip There's side is it's much harder to coordinate because anyone can do it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the blogosphere, you know, the blogosphere has been around for a while now, and it's very clear who the big personalities are. They Obviously, people know who gets more traffic. Um, there are leaders. Leaders have emerged. Twitter is new enough and not yet based in politics enough for there to be real clear leaders, although somebody like Patrick Ruffini is a great example. He has one of the biggest followings among uh, political uh, tweeters that I'm aware. I guess you can tell that Twitter is still new when even I kind of, uh, you know, find myself feeling a little silly for using some of the words associated with it, whereas, <laughs> whereas blog, 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 you know, hey, my grandma knows what a blog is. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not new and interesting anymore. Well, we've spent a good chunk of time on this, so I'm, yes. I'm tempted. We're, we're going to talk about tire gauge back and forth. I wonder if we should skip yes. that and, and go uh, beyond uh, drilling. Oh, sure. Uh, not a problem. Or would you uh, like to go take this next? Well, there was a, a, a lot of discussion, uh, certainly on the left. I, I'm curious what you found on the right. Um, looking at the poll, there's been all sorts of blogs doing poll, uh, poll analysis uh, some making the case that, uh, in sync with what you get from a lot of traditional media pundits, that uh, Barack Obama is underperforming in the polls relative right. to how Democrats are doing generally. And there's been some uh, contrary poll, contrarian poll analysis, from myself included, mm-hmm. um, uh, arguing otherwise, even saying that uh, knowing that Obama is overperforming relative to uh, John Kerry in a lot of key uh, demographic groups and overall in the fact that he is winning in almost every single poll. Um, so let me just... That, uh, can, you, can you tell me, is that is that John Kerry how he did in the fall, or is that how he was doing at this point in the race in 2004? Well, 538, uh, mm-hmm. which is a new blog that's come on the scene for his uh, poll analysis. The sabermetrics of uh, political numbers. <laughs> uh, Nate Silver uh, runs that. He contrasted... Uh, Barack Obama, I believe from the Gallup tracking poll, relative to how Kerry did in the final exit polls, uh, and found that Obama was beating Kerry in every single demographic, that's gender, that's race, that's age, that's region, uh, that's level of education, um, that's married or single, the only... Uh, demographic that Obama was weaker than uh, Kerry was amongst Democrats, yeah, which that Chris Bauer at, o- at Open Left had opined upon mm-hmm. as well. Uh, but you had, I'm just in the interest of trying to bring in some uh, non A list bloggers, some of the uh, blogging against commenters uh, called us the task for you know being a little too re- overly reliant on a handful. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was one blog, uh, the Left Anchor. Uh, that noted, even white voters look like they'll underperform for McCain this November. In 2004, George W. Bush secured this block with an impressive 17-point lead, but McCain currently leads here by only seven points. Uh, I believe Mark Ambender over at the Atlantic blog also pointed out that he, he said that white, uh, the white male gap is the gap, and McCain is underperforming. He's, a, he's ahead, but not ahead by enough if he is to actually pull this out. Uh, mm-hmm. 
No, but you had over at, um, uh, also I should, in, uh, your Dip Dive, which is where the Will I Am music videos of Obama have been aired initially. They actually have their own blog there. There's a guy there by the name of Hillel Aaron that talked about uh, uh, the Democracy Corps has a poll uh, asking uh, who gives you a warm feeling or a cold feeling. Uh, Bush gets a 32% warm. Obama gets a 47% warm. McCain's a 43% warm. Mm-hmm. The Democrat Party is 42% warm. So there's a lot of talk about Brock underperforming Democrats in this poll. He's overperforming the Democratic Party in general as far as warm feelings are concerned, while McCain overperforms Bush, which also speaks to the fact that um, to the McCain extent that the race working, is close. Right? What? I'm sorry? Uh, which is reflective of the fact that calling McCain McSame isn't working. <laughs> well, you know, I, wouldn't go, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go that far. I actually think the McSame argument has gone a lot farther than I would have expected it to. Uh, okay. You have seen, I think you have seen McCain weigh down to some degree, but there is that residual of, uh, effect. McCain's longstanding uh, strength right. amongst independents still is in play, and therefore and he, he, pulls, he pulls better than Bush. Actually, right. and, your, your, and your point is well taken there. You know, it's not necessarily independents, but some more conservative leading Democrats mm-hmm. uh, where McCain uh, has some strength. Um, but in my own poll, my own analysis at uh, Liberal mm-hmm. Oasis, and after this I'll, I'll shut up for a second. I won't get into every single uh, <laughs> blog post I have here. Um, a lot of people are looking at Obama vis-a-vis generic congressional ballot, and you'll see Democrats, uh, and this is something I had up on Liberal Oasis if I didn't, if I didn't say it before, um, you'll see Democrats having a 15-point lead versus Republicans or a 17-point lead. Sometimes it's more like 10 or 11, but it's typically double digits. Uh, and I think that's a little misleading because the level of support for Democrats is generally low 50s, and the Republicans will be in, in mid 30s. That's artificially low. That's I think that's a lot of disaffected conservatives staying in the undecided camp. They haven't really, really left the Republican Party. You'll see some base consolidation mm-hmm. by November. I think uh, Democrats usually tend to lead in terms of party ID anyway. Well, and, and that was um, a point. That was also a neat silver point in L.A. Times op-ed, that there's, okay. there's usually weaker Democratic loyalty, relatively speaking. Right. Uh, but Obama generally polls in the upper 40s, occasionally breaks 50. So it's not a question of uh, there being Obama has a five-point lead versus a 17-point generic ballot lead. It's a difference between being the upper 40s for Obama and the lower 50s for Democrats generally. Uh, mm-hmm. a, a mild discrepancy, but not. But I think expected when you're an individual person who's a front runner who gets hammered on a daily basis, the way that the party in general does not. Not mm-hmm. terribly surprising. And in the end, the guy's still ahead. So how how upset can you be? Um, right, but what right. are what are conservatives saying about these poll dynamics in general? You know, conservatives are not talking about it quite as much. Obviously, uh, it's not. At least Obama is not their candidate, so they're not framing it that way. But there's um, a sense that, hey, McCain's, you know, we didn't like McCain, but he sure is doing better than a lot of the other Republicans are. You know, um, not to get too far off topic, but, you know, in the past week, I think, uh, you know, McCain did not come into the general election with a widespread base of real eager support from uh, Republican bloggers. The, you know, the, the, one, of my, one, of my, one of my favorite, one of my favorite blogs this cycle is uh, get drunk and vote for McCain <laughs> it's, it's it's kind of the uh, John Kerry is a douchebag, but I'm voting for him anyway. <laughs> dot com of, of this cycle, and um, so they're not really big John McCain fans. They are going to put up with him, um, and uh, and um, I lost my train of thought real quick here. They're going to put up with him. Oh, okay. And then this this last week, they've actually been impressed with him more than they had been, and that's a lot of that is the celeb ad, which uh, probably that's way too much to get into. Uh, here, but you know, well, so but, but there, conservative bloggers were excited by that. There were some d- disparaging reviews, even amongst Republicans who get quoted in the traditional media, more open dissent, mm-hmm. I think, than you had seen. Most notably uh, from Republican Mike Party. Most notably from uh, Mike Murphy, who, of course, was the, uh, the main guy, M- McCain's right hand man in 2000, and John yeah. Weaver as well. These guys who feel like the McCain yeah, people see, who were once in McCain's yeah. circle now feel like the McCain image and brand is being sullied. Yeah, and then and, and they come from people who are, say, former Democrats like Mark McKinnon, who had been doing uh, uh, McCain's ads until it became clear that uh, Obama had the nomination 
and he stepped aside because he didn't want to be uh, he didn't want to be part of that. A uh, little little vague on that, and I'm surprised that hasn't been a bigger deal. Uh, but, but conservative is, bloggers have been generally supportive. Of the celeb ad, yes, I I would say that the comments coming from certainly Murphy Weaver, uh, you know, those those are not at all reflected uh, online. Republican bloggers are not too dissimilar from uh, from uh, Democratic bloggers in the sense that they do like, um, you know, they like a bit of fight. And McCain, uh, the, the the line on McCain's campaign from about the time that he wrapped up the nomination until uh, certainly when Obama got the nomination was that it was a wasted few months. He didn't really do anything. He tried to define himself positively, but, you know, that didn't seem to do a whole lot. I, I think that McCain already has a lot of positives with the public, so that was kind of um, – there wasn't a lot to be done there. Uh, but the celeb ad uh, knocked Obama off his, off his message for about a week and was quite successful in doing so. It, uh, it got some lefty bloggers, uh, Josh Marshall and Rick Perlstein, uh, most 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 notably, uh, making some arguments that certainly Republican bloggers felt was kind of ridiculous, and I think even some uh, uh, liberal bloggers agreed. Some of the arguments that were made that uh, from Josh Marshall, arguing that the ad was um, similar to the Harold Ford ad in the '04 or '06 cycle. 06 cycle, uh, where, you know, I see we put a, uh, a young, attractive white woman next to a, uh, a black man. This is clearly a racist ad, was what, um, what Marshall was saying. Rick Perlstein, I think, went even further comparing the, uh, the, the movie, comparing the ad to uh, The Triumph of the Will by Lenny Riefenstahl, um, as, if this was, as if the Republicans were trying to turn Obama into Hitler, something like that. The arguments didn't make a lot of uh, sense. I want to give credit to uh, Oliver Willis, who is a Media Matters employee, but on his personal blog, OliverWillis.com, uh, you know, um, and w- whether it matters that uh, Oliver Willis is African American himself, I'm not really sure. But what he said was that, uh, you know, come on, all right, this is a little bit too far. I don't think the ad was racist. The Hitler thing is definitely taking it too far. So the McCain campaign basically, I think, was able to cause a little – was create a little bit of a wedge between Obama and his uh, online supporters, sent a few of them off the deep end. Obama couldn't really talk about that or acknowledge that. So I think that was, that was something that was fairly impressive to, you know, to the right blogosphere about that. You know, well, as, far I as, need to, as far as – go ahead. I, I need to stand up for my, my campaign for America's future brother, Rick Perlstein. Sure, sure. Because uh, he was writing about this on our blog at ourfuture.org. dot uh, org, and, and he actually extrapolates it to a larger series uh, of FBN politics, and I won't say what the acronym uh, stands for on here. But, you know, he just wrote <laughs> just wrote Nixon Land, which was a, a deep analysis of right. how Nixon practiced practiced polarizing politics back then, the kind of tactics mm-hmm. that were that were used. And obviously, right. a lot of these things uh, are very you know, a lot of the analysis is inherently subjective. Um, but one thing he actually wrote in a post today, which I thought was notable, a, a commenter of his uh, who said that he had worked for uh, the gubernatorial campaign of Doug Wilder, who was the first uh, African-American governor elected uh, post-Reconstruction, um, said that the way that uh, Doug Wilder handled that campaign is that when the when the race baiting happens, you don't take the bait. Uh, mm-hmm. And in saying that even, with, you, know, even you know, putting aside whether or not these But was there race baiting? I think that's still... That definitely needs to be discussed. Do you, do you think, Bill Schurr, that there was race baiting in that ad? Well, uh, in following the advice of this commentary, putting aside whether these things were actually racist or not, right. uh, what, what Rick himself took from the commenter is, you know, even, even if you do think this is racist, mm-hmm. um, there is there's limited utility in, uh, in, in many cases in calling it out and generating a big discussion about it because some of these things are inherently subjective. Because mm-hmm. you can't always definitively prove what is going on, you tend to get bogged down in this polarizing muck and you don't get anywhere. And clearly that's not the way uh, Barack Obama has generally run his campaign. He very much wants right. to not be the candidate of, of racial grievance. Absolutely, uh, yeah. So I will leave it there. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let me, let me talk real briefly about you know what the rightosphere thinks about this. I'll tell you what, the right of sphere is, has always been skeptical of Obama, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so in, these, um, in, in, in the poll numbers where they find that, you know, uh, Obama is running, you know, a few points ahead of uh, McCain on average, 
which is certainly further back than, you know, uh, you know, or certainly it's further back than Dukakis was ahead of Bush at this point in '88. And uh, this is tend to be a pattern that Democrats have bigger leads and then go on to lose. So uh, I certainly I don't know if you can actually make any predictions out of this. Maybe that's a good thing for him. Maybe he's not overperforming too soon. Maybe he's not peaking too soon as, as Democrats had. But, you know, re- Republican bloggers tend to think that, you know, McCain, uh, that Obama is not always cracked up to be. And they think that maybe, I, I, maybe, I maybe the strange, public sees that. I find that's a strange phenomenon. I, I, I see it in conservative blogs. I see it in the McCain campaign. There, there, There's a general disrespect. There's a general sense that, you know, this guy's an empty suit. And it will mm-hmm. eventually become obvious to everybody if we, you know, push that argument out there a little bit with the celebrity type stuff, and he'll be exposed as the uh, pretender that he is. And that just strikes me. At, I feel every time, you know, that's what the Clinton campaign, in a sense, tried to do. Obviously, not celebrity stuff, but there was a sense that mm-hmm. that he wasn't ready to lead, and he and, right. he, and he, he's 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 too green, he's too new. And mm-hmm. I I just don't when you see Obama in the hot seat. Uh, mm-hmm. He clears that bar every time, uh, so it just strikes me. I don't know. He's as had a- some difficult. Uh, I remember during the primaries, he had some. He had some debates where he, you know, stumbled a little bit. And I looked, mean, you, uh, yeah, but you. I mean, you can say that every single candidate in a YouTube era, when every utterance you say is is ridiculously mm-hmm. micro track. You know, the, everybody's exhausted. Everybody's overworked. There's always going to be minor slip ups. Yeah, but he's but, not been perfect. I mean, he certainly has his. As is McCain, Obama has made his share of gaffes. And said his share of silly things over the, the past. The, just the the bar on what a gap is has been ridiculously lowered in this process. <laughs> you know, uh, a, a, a minor verbal slip is not a gaff. Uh, I wish I'd compare to the real good one because I know there are a few, but I know there are a few good ones about McCain too. So I don't really care to get uh, too far into the weeds on who's committing bigger gaffes. I think we tried that one a few months yeah. ago. I mean, it would be a much bigger deal, of course, if Obama was on his foreign trip. Mm-hmm. And said something uh, completely impolitic while staying next to Prime Minister or Mayor or staying next to Maliki. Right. It's right. Like, that when this guy's on the world stage, he can't cut it. That would have been a huge problem. And if you'd set right. that bar to say this guy can't handle being president, then you see him not handling being president. Then yes, right. that would be terribly damaging. But that never yeah. happens. So I don't understand why you keep pounding. Why? Why? I mean, not just you personally, of course. But why conservative <laughs> blogosphere is think that right. this argument has enough juice in it to get Obama below 50% permanently and McCain above 50% for once? Um, that is a good question. I mean, uh, I, I, can that actually carry through the election? I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, certainly, I think, you know, they're looking for that there's a commander-in-chief test. Does Obama pass that? I know David Brooks was arguing, um, well, not about the commander-in-chief test, but about whether people knew who he was. And, you know, certainly a candidate can introduce themselves over the period of time. Um, I think that the commander-in-chief test may be harder. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a real clear sense of it. I, I find the subject fascinating, too, uh, but I, I couldn't tell you uh, exactly, exactly where it's going. You know, and I think I think one thing that will be interesting to see over the coming months is, and this is why I don't take polls too seriously now, um, is because the people who are in these polls, people who are being, people who currently call themselves likely voters, um, are the people who are following the news much more much more frequently, and yet peop- the turnout has been up over the past few years, and um, you know I think the people who will be turning out in the fall still haven't tuned in yet. Maybe not. Won't, maybe won't even tune in exactly uh, around Labor Day either. You have you have two classes of people in this country. You have those that follow politics closely, and you have those that don't follow it very much at all. And thanks to things like thanks to blogs and thanks to the internet in general, the people who are able to follow uh, people who are interested in following politics are following it very intensely right now, and they're watching blogging heads probably thinking through a lot of the same questions that we are. I'm much more fascinated by the people who are outside of the little bubble that I honestly uh, occupy here inside the Beltway. How about the people, you know, who, um, you know, they're not following politics too closely, even though they're probably still going to vote. They, um, thanks to the Internet, thanks to blogs, they also don't have to, uh, you know, follow the, the news too closely. They can read gossip blogs. They can read, read Perez Hilton, and uh, they can get as much sports as they can get piped into their house over broadband. And, uh, you know, I'd love, I, basically I want to see where this is at in about 
two months' time. Uh, what, are, what, are, what are they going to think uh, of Obama? Does, does Obama – maybe is Obama at a disadvantage because he ha- still has to introduce himself to them and they won't be paying attention until too late? Uh, well, there's just, a, just there'll a be a period of polling, I think, after both conventions and both VP right. picks in mid-September. Yeah. You can see if that shakes out some of those undecideds. There'll be a period, mm-hmm. I think, after the debates finish in mid-October that might right. shake out some more. Um, and then you really have a much better sense of where, where the race is at. But you're, it, it, right. it would seem that's why you know, no one breaks 50 consistently. Obama joining upper 40s, McCain lower 40s, about 10 to 15 percent undecided. That's right. probably going to stay that way, you know, barring, you know, uh, mm-hmm. unexpected, earth-shattering external event. Um, right. That's, that's not uh, a, a, a crazy uh, state of affairs. And, of course, after the conventions is when uh, we will finally know who the uh, candidates have chosen as their VPs. And maybe as a way of transition, let me tell you, I've been fascinated over the past week uh, watching as the, uh, the lefty blogosphere – has recoiled in horror at the notion that Virginia Governor uh, Tim Kaine could possibly be the uh, Obama's pick for VP. Tim well, Kaine, there's, there's, there's a, there's a you, split there, I would say. Not on Kaine specifically, but a split in terms of how much import to put on the VP pick. Sure. Um, you had, uh, if I can find my my examples here quickly, uh, you had you know Matt Stoller and Chris Barrows at Open Left uh, definitely expressing um, some concern over either Tim Kaine uh, mm-hmm. or Evan Bayh. Uh, Matt called by uh, you know a Democratic Dan Quayle. Um, <laughs> where did I, I put that? I'll I'll find it. Um, and you had other folks uh, going at Tim Kaine. You know, Stoller had talked right. about how uh, the the Virginia blog raising Kane stopped calling itself raising Kane when they didn't think Correct. Tim Kane was governing as progressive enough as he campaigned. Um, it's of course still at raisingkane dot com, but the they only go by RK on the right. website now. And also you right. have Dylan Matthews over at Tapped who wrote a more uh, uh, substantive post on buy. Uh, mm-hmm. By as well, the right of both Obama and the party at large, he not only voted to authorize the invasion of Iraq in 02, he was an honorary co chairman of the Committee to Liberate Iraq, along with Lieberman and McCain. If those associates weren't bad enough, the group's members included Bill Crystal, James Woolsey, and McCain foreign policy guru, guru Randy uh, Schinnerman. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, even in this Congress, By voted for the relatively weak Levin Amendment, calling for redeployment, but against the more hard hitting Feingold Amendment, with both, both which Obama and Clinton supported. Mm-hmm. Uh, 50% NARAL rating, voted for the flag-burning amendment and the bankruptcy reform, undecided on the school prayer amendment, supports McCain's proposal to boot Russia from the G8, and he supported the Kyle Lieberman amendment that Obama made a key part of its critique on Clinton. Mm-hmm. Uh, if Obama wants to alienate progressives while reinforcing the media narratives that he's flip-flopping and moving to the center, then buys a good pick. If he wants to win and work towards liberal policy goals while in office, I suggest you look elsewhere. That's still a map that he's tapped. Mm-hmm. But having said all that, you had a Boo Man Tribune, uh, say, needless to say, the selection of Bayh would be met by stony silence at best within the progressive movement. Many would be outraged and consider it a betrayal of trust. For my part, I'd be bitterly disappointed, but I wouldn't read it as anything more or less than a strategic calculation. And Atrios over at Eschaton concurred with that. As of the mm-hmm. rest of the campaign, Obama's VP choice isn't going to be designed to please me. Maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised, but I just don't think that's all that important. As Boo Man says, it's mostly a strategic choice. I'll be pissed if it ends up being bad strategy, but I don't really claim to have deep insight about who would be the best strategic choice. So even within the mm-hmm. liberal blogosphere, you don't have a consensus whether the VP pick says something about yeah. the ideological direction that Obama would actually take as president. Maybe what I should have said about Kane in the first place was that uh, among the bloggers who know him best, say Lowell Feld at <laughs> Raising Kane, or, or my coworker Ben Tribbett, better known as Not Larry Sabato. Um, yeah, Ben was saying something the other day about how you know he'll go jump off a cliff if uh, if, if if Kane is the nominee. Well, always um, your, your your home critics are always the worst. True enough, true enough. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm actually recording from uh, Arlington, Virginia. I said Washington, but I fibbed slightly because I'm about maybe metro 100 area. yards from the Potomac. What but do kind of? but do the Virginia bloggers either on the left or the right think that if you you, know, you may not like Kane personally, you might not think he is good enough on on actual issues but yeah. do they think that he would not help put virginia in the obama column um i think that you know they would see it as a sign that obama is not going to 
governance of progressive. If they choose somebody like 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 Kane, who has let down progressives on really a pretty impressive list of, uh, of issues, um, that that certainly would be a bad sign. Also, they do have uh, Virginia has one of the more influential and widely read blogospheres, and I mean state blogospheres is influencing national blogs. Um, Matt Stoller quoted uh, extensively from uh, somebody raising Cain who's not Lowell. Um, you know, going through the list, you know, so, so basically national bloggers will look to the people who know, you know, know that person best. And, uh, you know, I think Obama certainly can afford to annoy uh, progressive bloggers. And he certainly and he has. has. Well, and he has, right, to a large degree. <laughs> and he's still leading. But I don't. Oh and yeah. He sells oh, yeah. higher enthusiasm from his base than McCain has from his. I, I'm. 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 I mean, I think it's a lot. But can he afford to really alienate them? I think that that. I think it would alienate a big chunk of them. Obviously, I think H. Rios and Boo Man have uh, a little more, a little more mature look on that. Um, I don't mean to. Uh, I, I know Lowell and uh, Ben both, so I don't mean to call them immature. But I think that that's you know that there is some distance, as as you put it. They're able to put some distance and be a little more philosophical about it. Now, is there the same uh, intensity being looked at McCain's VP pick from conservative bloggers? There is totally not. Nothing even the like the like it. Uh, That's a little surprising because you, there's been a lot of you know, a lot of consternation with McCain and conservative and the conservative movement for so long. Why isn't this being translated to the VP pick? I think maybe because with, for McCain, he's already you know their, their fourth pick. They're they're, they 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 do not hold them up to any ideals that I think uh, the progressives hold Obama to. You know, there are a lot of names kicking, and I think I, when I was doing research earlier today, before this, I was going through Technorati looking for Veep Talk, and it was really going 10 to 1, you know, uh, lefty blogs as opposed to righty blogs hmm. talking about it. You know, so I think, I'm always surprised. I, yeah. I have few, mem- few conservative members of my extended family, but I do have a couple. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and one is, is, is intently looking at that pic. She is, she is dying it for it to be Bobby Jindal. Oh, okay, uh, or right. someone else that is a, is a true conservative because yeah. she is really having a hard time stomaching a vote for McCain. She wants that kind of reassurance. So if she knows Jindal, she must be fairly well plugged in because I don't think Jindal's a national figure just yet. She must be one of the influentials or Citizen 2.0 or polyfluentials. There are all these names. Yeah, I, I, to I, I think she's a, she's, a, she's a regular conservative talk radio listener. There you go. Okay, sure. I would probably describe my father, too, uh, who we've discussed and his joining of Drill Here, Drill Now uh, in a previous edition. Um, you know, I think, you know, if it's Romney, there will be a lot of grumbling about that. Romney was never terribly popular in the wider conservative blogosphere. Uh, the Romney bloggers are, to a large extent, still around, and they'll certainly be thrilled about it. I think, and I think Romney may be the most, most plausible. I heard a rumor about two weeks ago that Romney was going to be picked last Friday. And at that point, I was like thinking, all right, well, so it's going to be Romney. And then, and then it didn't happen, even though the rumors sounded credible enough when, I, when it was forwarded to me. But, you know, they say, hey, never trust email forwards, even if they come from people you think might know. Now, um, I heard on MSNBC over the last couple of days that uh-huh. the campaign people were telling reporters it will be a surprise. Now, if it's going to be a surprise, I would think that would rule out Romney and Palenti because those are the two that get talked about the most. Those are definitely the top two guesses. And I think, I think, the, I think the conservative blogosphere would be happier with Palenti. He's a much more down-the-line conservative. Really? Or at least he doesn't have, he doesn't have as many problems you know, with, with, the, with, 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 with the right as I just uh, remember Obama seeing Palenti. I, I saw Palenti speak at CPAC uh-huh. where he gave a speech how we can't be Wall Street Republicans, we have to be Sam's Club Republicans. We can't be Country Club Republicans, but Sam's okay. Club Republicans. Mm-hmm. And there was dead silence in that room. <laughs> they did right. not care for his speech at all. To some extent, this may be, uh, this may be, an, effect of, uh, this may be an effect of the fact that uh, people don't know Polenti quite as well. Um, and, but where I had not heard anybody in the – from the Minnesota blogosphere uh, actually contains some very large, uh, large blogs on the right – Powerline, um, Captain Ed, who now blogs for uh, uh, HotAir.com, is also from uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and um, you know uh, I'm sure I'm sure Powerline probably has some criticisms to make, but they're nothing that are making their way around the uh, around the blogosphere, and I, I don't know I don't know exactly what they've said about them, so I want to be clear about that. Um, you know the, the the if there is okay Jindal is definitely a name who's tossed around a lot. 
but I think that the, the, the conservative blogosphere is pretty smart about this. They don't really want Jindal to be on, on the ticket. They think that, um, you know, being on the McCain ticket, especially if McCain loses, which is probably what they think is going to have happen, uh, will not necessarily be good for Jindal. Also, he's been in office for a very short period of time. Let him be a governor for a few years, and then he will be, you know, then he'll be ready to run in 12 or 16. I feel very happy for him to keynote, I assume. Yeah, you know, in fact, there's a, there's a move that it's, it's not clear that he's going to get a, a keynote uh, a speech at the convention, and so there is, a, a Patrick Graffini, once again, is, is starting up a, uh, a movement to get, um, like, a Facebook campaign and blog campaign uh, to make sure that Jindal gets uh, speaking time during prime time. And uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, somebody like Graffini will be heard by convention organizers. I mean, I, I know that he knows people there, and uh, so maybe they aren't the ones that make the decisions, but certainly, you know, they're gonna, if, if, if they don't put Jindal on during prime time, you're going to see a lot of consternation about that. Now, you've seen some speculation about uh, out-of-the-box picks for McCain, like mm-hmm. Fred Smith, who's the CEO of Federal Express, or probably I've not the really arena. seen that, honestly. I, 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 I saw the Democrats included him. Demo- the DNC put up a website the other day called thenextcheney.com, which is one of the sillier, less effective uh, microsites that I've seen, basically trying to tie all the potential VP picks to Cheney in ways that were all different and mostly Im- implausible or very, very tenuous. And they had him on there, and that was the first time I'd seen uh, Fred Smith. It was floated really by um, the page, Mark Halpern's The Page. Okay. I think that's where that – I mean, it was, it was kicked around other places before, but more recently – there was a there was a Mark Halpern post that said there are there's a portion of McCain's team mm-hmm. that believes he needs that he needs a pick that uh, has business experience that has military mm-hmm. experience that has, that did mm-hmm. not run for elective office before it has no connection to George Bush um, and that essentially fit the right. bill for Fred Smith and to a lesser extent uh, Carly Fiorina who has all that but the military experience right. but has. And uh, she certainly has. She ha- She, you know, she she's been vetted in the media, you could say. And um, you know, she, she didn't. Bomb, I, I think but there's more didn't... on her that hasn't been t- said about her yet. Say that again. There's more on her that could be said that hasn't been said yet. Yeah, oh, that sounds like a sounds like a threat. <laughs> uh, I, certainly, not, she I has... don't mean to um, uh, insinuate anything, tawdry. Uh, but for example, well, she had uh, a, a, when I, when she left HP. Uh, there was a uh, obviously trouble. I forget the exact nature of the scandal. It had to do with, you know, spying on employees. I believe um, definitely right. not I mean, good. I mean, and that's, that's, that's not stuff that's out there, wall. but it hasn't been recycled recently in her, mm-hmm. in her media boomlet. Yeah, I mean, she she's a plausible, uh, very plausible cabinet pick. You know, that she can withstand the scrutiny from HP for that. But for the VP slot, it's too much for that. But speaking as yeah, speaking of you know out of the box candidates and women. The one that I think is the most fun is uh, Sarah Palin, a mm-hmm. very popular governor of uh, Alaska, and um, you know, uh, quite a good-looking woman as well. Um, she uh, she's got certainly uh, there are people that definitely want her to be VP, uh, who are active on Facebook, who are active. Um, there's there's I think Palin for VP dot dot com. Um, I think she's very very unlikely to be the pick. Uh, but she has a lot to recommend her. She's putting Democrats in jail, which is, uh, you know, which is which is good. Um, Sean Parnell, her lieutenant governor, is opposing Don Young, the uh, probably going to be indicted any day now, corrupt Republican congressman from Alaska. She's, you know, she's she's rooting out corruption in her own party. She is, uh, you know, uh, being she's a fairly tough governor. Uh, I don't know exactly how conservative she is, but. But she's tough, and, you know, that always counts for something. And uh, did I mention she was good-looking? <laughs> <laughs> so the, you see, I like to be for her. Are conservative bloggers uh, doing the same for these Fred Smith, Carly Fiena possibilities? Are they saying, wow, that is just absolutely crazy? I can't believe that's being seriously considered. Is there any reaction there? About Palin, you mean? About Fiorina and Smith. Well, Fiorina has been able – Fiorina has been, you know, talked about uh, a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's not totally crazy, but – Nobody really expects it. Fred Smith, maybe you have more estimation for Halperin's insight into, uh, you know, I, I conservative think, minds. I think it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think it's nuts. I, I, I don't know that much about him. I know, you know, I, I, he's the head of FedEx. He, he appears 
I think, briefly in the um, Michael Lewis book, The Blind Side, which is sort of he does for football what he did for baseball with Moneyball. Kind of, kind of. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know that much about, about him. I don't think it's very likely, for sure. You know, Eric Cantor is another name been floated, but I, Eric Cantor is not, is not terribly well-liked by conservative bloggers. I think there's a sense that He's a young guy who has been – he's been young, so a rising star. He was – you know, he had a good, you know, patina to him a few years ago. Uh, but how long can you be a rising star is one question. He's also has been aligned with the anti-reform previous leadership uh, and some of the current leadership in the uh, Republican House caucus. So I think Cantor is a possibility, but he wouldn't excite anybody if he was the, if he was the pick. Really? I think so. I'll tell you what the best, what the best uh, theory that I've heard so far, and this comes from a, a friend of mine uh, named Eric Pfeiffer who writes for uh, CQ.com. The Ground Game is the name of the blog. And now his, his theory is that McCain already knows that he's going to lose. And so McCain, who detests, uh, who detests uh, Mitt Romney, is going to pick Romney, put him on the ticket. <laughs> so when McCain loses, as you know, he knows that he's going to, he's going to take down Mitt Romney's political career with him. A murder-suicide, if you will. And uh, while I, I'm not sure that really adds up, it's, it's, I, think it's, I think it's funny. That's, uh, that's the only reason I shared it, really. <laughs> uh, well, I should ask, since we're doing all this musing on the, on the conservative side, I, I do mm-hmm. think, I have seen in the, in the liberal blogosphere uh, more support than I might have expected for Governor Sebelius, Kathleen Sebelius of Kansas. Mm-hmm. There's a sense among some bloggers that uh, she, you know, you know, she positions herself in a centrist way in a red state, but she's still right. governed with more liberal progressive principles successfully mm-hmm. and won re-election doing it. So there's, there seems to be more goodwill there for her than of all the so-called shortlist picks uh, by so Jane plausible? Biden. I'm sorry? So you think she is plausible, Sebelius? I, she's certainly plausible. I mean, yeah. I think she's definitely on, uh, I don't know where this the short list is. I think right. she's been on some state of the short list at some time, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but who knows what the actual short list is or what criteria Obama is actually using. Right. Uh, and he's certainly not going to pick someone based on what bloggers want. I think that's pretty well established that he's not looking to the blogosphere for strategic advice or any uh, anyone else in the uh, Democratic chattering class. Um, right. But I think of all the shortlist picks that have been mentioned, to be able to be the one that would probably get the most uh, outward support from liberal bloggers. Okay. Um, I'll tell you one that, one that always seemed interesting to me was, uh, you know, Janet Napolitano. Maybe I even mentioned this the last time I was here. You know, Napolitano, she's also from Arizona. She's the governor. She's quite popular. She and, uh, McCain is pulling <laughs> his little soft in Arizona. Right, right. That's why it would be, you know, kind of a almost a mean trick on, o- yeah. on Obama's part to choose uh, Napolitano, who's got a pretty good record. I think it's fairly moderate, but wouldn't offend uh, progressives, and um, and possibly steal away Arizona from McCain. It would sure. be, uh, that would also be funny. But also unlikely to happen, and I'm not sure it quite adds up. But again, the, the, the veep, veep, veep stakes. You know, we've talked about it for several minutes. I'll tell you, veep stakes. Kind of pointless, right? We have no clue whatsoever. Well, no, we, just, I think more so game. than usual. You know, I, I felt with Kerry, I felt I had a fairly good sense of what kind of criteria he was going to bring to this. It would be sort of <laughs> conventional, conventional wisdom criteria. And with Obama, right. one, I think no one really knows what criteria he's using. And two, I think he's got a lot deeper bench to work with. So there isn't as, as small a pool of people that you have to focus on. So it's much harder to game out. And, and as I think is often said, very little actual impact on what's going to happen on, on election day, and certainly nobody's talking about John Edwards for VP as of the past the past two weeks or so. On that note, <laughs> why don't we on that call note, this a day. It has been it has been good talking to you, Bill. Good talking to you too. <laughs> All right, this has been fun. I, let's do it again soon. Excellent. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye bye.